you're in an interesting position having been a journalist, writing about the kinds of challenges that tech is, is facing now, now being an investor. From the seat where you are now, is this an opportunity for innovation or is this just an existential crisis? <laughs> I do think it's an opportunity for innovation. Uh, you know, as you guys know, these things, innovation in general at a very high level seems to be cyclical in nature where companies are started during interesting times, right, where you think that they wouldn't necessarily be started because there's just no room for new companies to come into the scene. But it does, it is really starting to feel like that this is one of those times where there's a bunch of just... Uh, a bunch of little interesting companies out there that are that are sort of planting their seeds right now and, and will hopefully in you know five to ten years grow into the next big thing. Case study for that kind of example is? I mean there have been many things over the years, but like you know, Instagram dating back to a few years ago and before that, even Facebook in the era before that, right? It used to be that uh, the IPO was the default expectation of what the exit was gonna be. And then, you know, maybe in the enterprise, a couple companies, you know, Cisco was known as a prolific acquirer. Now it seems like companies are not only staying private longer, but you've got a number of huge tech companies that acquire a lot. Even Apple's acquiring a lot of smaller things. Facebook, Alphabet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how do you think about what the, what the exit likelihood is now based on what it was 10 years ago and what the ideal outcome is? Yeah, I mean, as we're seeing now, obviously, the, the IPO window has, has opened up and we're finally seeing uh, a bunch of companies that have raised a bunch of capital over the past several years finally being able to go out into the public markets. And that was just not available for a long time. And so I think it was the two things playing off of one another, both a lot of capital in the private markets, being able to extend uh, the runway and the, just the ability for these companies to grow in a private manner. Uh, mixed with the public markets not just being ready for these companies yet, and now it's coming back the other way a little bit, it feels like, and seems like a, a good natural position again. And maybe, you know, potentially like we were just talking about, for a potential reset in a way that it allows newer sort of startups to come back into the scene. Is there a pileup of dry powder? What happens to all that exit money? Where, is there, is, can, you, can we start to uh, build stereotypes of where it's going to go? I don't know if there's a, a pile-up of it necessarily. I do think that uh, you know these these companies are increasingly doing a ton of different things, and so as they move into different markets, there's just uh, there's just more money to be spent on new things. And you know, in a general sense, we live in a world where tech permeates every part of our lives increasingly, and so there's just a lot to do, and that requires a lot of capital. And I do think that there's. Just a lot of capital still out there for a lot of interesting startups to, to come out because I do think that we're going to just see more and more companies being formed in these next few years as a result of what we're seeing right now. Speaking of just, just general interesting things, we're talking a lot about Beyond Meat, which has had an amazing run as a stock. I mean, of course, it's down 20 percent today on a downgrade, but it looks to me like a month ago, GV invested in Impossible Foods, which is a rival to it. What do you think of the run and the interest in this space and why is... Alphabet investing in fake meat. So we've actually been an investor in Impossible Foods for a while, yeah. um, dating back a few years now. And I think when we were sort of looking at that investment, it's not one that I'm in charge of, but it's, it's definitely a, obviously a compelling space with what uh, Beyond Meat has done in the public markets. But as a private company, Impossible Foods, you've seen the, the deal that they have with Burger King. They're really going for an interesting scale. Uh, and the public appetite literally seems to be there uh, for these products. I mean, I don't know if you guys have tried them yourselves. I yeah. honestly love the product. It's really good. I don't, I mean, it, you know, you can argue whether or not it tastes exactly like a, like a meat-based hamburger, but it's just a really good product, and it, and it tastes well. And I think the market, both the, the, uh, you know, the public market, but also just the market for uh, Impossible with, with Burger King and all the other partnerships that they have is showing that, that there is real demand for Everyone these. Everyone who's trying to figure out the total addressable market looks at alternative or plant-based beverages. Yeah. Is that a fair analog? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, in our cert current environment where everyone's trying to be a little bit more health conscious, but also just thinking about the environment with, with the way that animals are raised and, and certainly, you know, the climate and everything that's going on, I do think that, uh, that there's parallels to that, yeah. How much does nationalism, how much do trade and tariff barriers enter into the conversation now over the past few months when you at GV are looking at companies to invest in where they're based and the implications of their technology? Yeah, I mean, honestly, for us, because we invest in the relative earlier stages, we're not too concerned about that um, because there's just so much room to grow within the U.S. mainly, but we also invest in Europe as well. And so there's just so much, uh, so much greenfield in front of them before they get to the point where they start to think about the worldwide expansion uh, elements of the company. Finally, uh, you're in Uber, I believe, yes? Yes. Uh, not Lyft, though. 
No. Right. So, capital. Um, what do you? What's your characterization of the two models? And in general, are you a fan of big, broader moonshot? Uh, you know, diversification or a pure play, maybe profitable sooner kind of model. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, obviously, Dara, who's who's taken over Uber, has done a, an excellent job getting the company public and. And they clearly have a game plan going forward for what they want to do. And, and I'm sure, you know, Lyft as well has, has their game plan for what they want to do. I think that that is one of those massive markets that they're, that they're both going after where, you know, there's potential. Uh, we've seen it on, a daily, on our daily lives, right, potential to, to just change the world in which we live. And so when we look at those, we just see the, the huge potential to still grow into that. Does autonomous really have to come sooner than later for profitability to happen? Uh, I don't know if necessarily that's that's the case. As you sort of mentioned, there's there's all sorts of different avenues that these companies can go down. I think uh, autonomous technology is uh, is one of those things that's just massive implications for far beyond even ride sharing, um, just in terms of society in general. And so uh, I think that we're still a ways away from to see how that plays out, but not necessarily.